right so um, a question at the beginning are there anyone over here who has not attended the sutta discussion before first time can you raise your hand oh, okay hopefully you will not be disappointed by the end <laughs> i heard that some of you uh, already attended my some sutta discussion somewhere other places all right so it's not a big deal uh, it is uh, something that uh, you will uh, work on a continuous process because uh, uh, you won't be able to pick up everything at the same time what matters is that uh, understanding what you call uh, the certain framework context of the sutta studies that means in order for us to study suttas we should know the methodology now uh, you may have uh, noticed i mean those of you who have already attended some sutta study uh, classes that uh, when you only study certain teachings from only one sutta you may run into issues why is it suttas are con contextual in order for you to understand a certain teaching from a certain sutta you may have to understand the same context same uh, teaching that has been uh, described explained analyzed synthesized in other suttas basically from early buddhism we have a word called early buddhism so early buddhism refers to the first four nikayas diga madhyama sangyutta anguttara and some works of kurdaka nikaya true but we primarily take diga madhyama sangyutta anguttara as the earliest teachings of the buddha that that have been shared by all the other schools theravada uh, and then uh, other theravada schools sarvastivada the mahayana schools mahasangika yogachara uh, madhyamika and the rest of the other schools and vajrayana as well that means there is a clear difference between different types of buddhism theravada buddhism is not early buddhism exclusively this is a mistake i will tell you why it is theravada school is the oldest school that has been uh, alive at the moment who has been preserving all the texts but over time theravada school has proposed its own version to uh, highly defend the uh, ideas now let me tell you one thing now uh, what is called uh, abidam is one very good example in early buddhism uh, now some some might be confused about early buddhism early buddhism means according to scholars and uh, i mean serious uh, uh, i mean scholarly uh, people uh, are the unadulterated unrefined pure version of the buddhist thoughts in early buddhism you don't see samatha and vipassana you see loosely but buddha does not present them as to samatha vipassana are qualities of your meditation same meditation you cannot separate them who separated them visuddhi mark it's a uh, book written by uh, a monk uh, south indian monk buddha gosha uh, his predecessor could not do that monk buddha dat he went to sri lanka the mahavihara monks asked him to write a thesis because at that time the pali commentaries were in sinhala language in sinhalese so they wanted to bring pali into that so uh, it is said that the sinhala works of uh, those pa because pali language has no letters right only sounds so those sinhala works were uh, destroyed in some ways so what happened maybe they say after translating them into uh, transcribing them into pali 
uh, they burnt it, they burnt them. But we don't know what really happened. So the thing is, in Visuddhi Manka, we see the meditation has been, uh, but because Satipat has been devised as, distributed as Samatha and Vipassana. But when the Buddha talks about Satipatthanas, especially Samma Sati, the most important part of meditation, he never uh, discriminates certain types of meditation. It is only Sammasati that one has been. Who brought up uh, Samatha Vipassana? Theravada school. This is one very good uh, example. And there are a lot of other examples. So that's why you want to study, you should study pure Buddhism, which has been the basis to Mahayana, Theravada, Sarvastivada, perhaps Vajrayantra. Now I'm trying to espouse an argument that uh, the importance of studying suttas from early Buddhism. So you will learn the early Buddhism, unadulterated, pure version of Buddhism. So Samatha Vipassana is a very good example. Now from today, do, do not uh, insult anybody <laughs> who is doing Samatha and Vipassana. I mean, whatever uh, meditation method somebody might teach, especially from uh, Myanmar. Uh, this is, Vipassana was taken uh, as a stand-alone practice from uh, 19th century uh, Burmese uh, uh, Vipassana school as a uh, what do you call uh, as a counter argument to the uh, colonized version of uh, Myanmar because they wanted to show that we have something more than you the West uh, compared to the Western Enlightenment anyway so there are a lot of differences because I recently gave a talk uh, in Trangano uh, last uh, I think Thursday uh, it's about uh, the difference between uh, early Buddhism and other schools. So you will understand them very well. And there was a Western monk who wrote a very interesting work uh, about this. He is none other than Bhante Sujato. Uh, the differences between early Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism. So it's, it's, it's very apparent. If you can see that, you can read the book, you can see the difference. So now I, I was trying to tell you the importance of studying these early suttas. So, even when you study these early suttas, you need to refer to other suttas to understand the context of one particular sutta. So if you only study one sutta completely, probably I don't know, I mean, uh, whether it is really being done by many, because you need a thinking in Pali. You have to think in Pali. Mostly, now, say for instance, today you will see that if you go to this translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi, good trans, I mean, better translation, you will see the, uh, what do you call, the overall understanding of the sutta at the end. So, uh, in, now for, for example, in order for you to understand a sutta very well, what I suggest is, is to think in Pali. How can you think in Pali? Because it is a language. So, in order for you to understand the context of that particular section in Pali, you should have to think in Pali. Now, when you speak in English, you can't translate from Mandarin uh, Hokkien to, you think in Mandarin and you translate to English. You can't do that all the time. If you are a fluent speaker, you have to think in English, right? Otherwise, you will translate into other languages and then talk. Sometimes it works, sometimes it might not work. One example is, uh, the many meanings to one Pali word. Now, let's say, evang me sutang ekang samayang bhagava, where is it mentioned? This is a very uh, stock, ex stock uh, phrase in many suttas, almost many. Was this given by the Buddha? No, this was added by the uh, senior monks who, what you call, preserved the suttas. Then here, evang me sutang, I have heard Ekang uh, Samayam Bhagava, once upon a time, the Buddha was so and so. Samayam, the word Samayam. Samayam means time, once upon a time, right? So this Pali word Samayam has nine meanings. It has nine meanings. So if you just go for a translation in a dictionary, dictionary will give you only one or two translations. That's why, you have to think in Pali. Is it possible to think in Pali? 
This is the other problem. Is it possible? It might take a longer time. Then somebody might think, oh, from tomorrow onwards, I have to go to a Pali class. Seriously. Will that work for you? Now you're going to learn the language. How, what would you learn? Manuso rukkamha patati. The man falls from the tree. Vanaru rukkamha davati. Monkey uh, runs from the tree. This is a language. It takes time. Perhaps you might not understand. Because then you will have to learn the Pali in the text also. So that is why the Buddha said, you have to learn under a certain scholarly or maybe uh, knowledgeable monk or whoever. Then you don't need to refer to all these things. That is why Buddha uses a particular Pali word that not, not many people understand. It's not properly translated to. That listening is more important. You can see here. Asuta vato. Asuta means, now they translate, uninstructed. <coughs> uninstructed. Now asuta means, suta means listening, having listened. Asuta means having not listened. To what? Dhamma. The Buddha clearly says, Aryasavaka is noble disciple. Sut, uh, what do you call? Sutama Aryasavaka. The noble disciple who is always listening to Dhamma talks. And the opposite is the Putujjana, Asutava Putujjana, the unenlightened person who does not listen to Dhamma. Then why this listening is, is such matter into the Dhamma part? Because you will learn a lot by listening from the right person. So that's why I encourage it might not be a Pali class, serious Pali class, so you will have to listen to Dhamma talks. That is a necessity. Not from one particular speaker, from many speakers, I encourage. Listen to many speakers, then you will know, then you will understand by yourself how these explanations are going to work. Alright, so now you understood the importance of studying uh, early suttas from early Buddhism. This is a sutta from early Buddhism. And then the problems in studying uh, these suttas. If you don't have a good Pali knowledge, if you do, if, if the speaker doesn't have a good Pali knowledge, then that speaker will depend on an English translation. Translations are very dangerous. At least they are supportive, but there are issues. All right. So today's sutta that we are going to uh, discuss is what do you call it? Dutiya Loka Dhamma Sutta. Actually, there is another uh, name for this sutta. What is it? You can see it uh, from the uh, sutta center probably. Loka Vipatti Sutta. Maybe if you type Loka Vipatti, there are many meanings, uh, many, many names for this sutta. You can see Loka Vipatti Sutta. This is the translation given by, I think, uh, Access to Insight by uh, Venerable Tanisaro. Ta Ta All right. Loka Vipatti. This is one name for this sutta. Loka means? Loka. Ah. Ah, this is something we have to study first. We have to study what does loka mean in Buddhist context. There are two meanings. One is the physical world. The second one is the formations. The, the world of formation is what the Buddha is always talking about. Buddha is not concerned about the physical world. Right? Uh, because there was one, uh, there was uh, there was a deva called Rohitasa. This is one other sutta, Anguttara Nikaya, Rohitasa Sutta. In this sutta, this deva came to see the Buddha and then told the Buddha, Bhante, in my past life, I have been a very, uh, what do you call, uh, powerful ascetic who can tra travel to many other places in the universe. So I thought I want to physically go to other places as far as much as I can. So I uh, started uh, my journey. So when I uh, set my foot, it was just as from Western Ocean, sorry, Eastern Ocean to Western Ocean. It is just as somebody is trying to set foot from uh, Indian Ocean to Atlantic or Pacific. I mean, it's quite fast. But what happened, 
I only stop for washroom and then eating and all that. But halfway of my journey of finding the end of the universe, I wanted to go to the end of the universe. Then I died uh, on the way. Then the Buddha said, this is a futile effort. The world that I am talking is not the physical world. So the world I am talking is the formations. Formations mean sankhara. That means we are creating our own sankharas. We are struggling with our mental world, right? which has sankharas. And then the Buddha also said, the four noble truths are not outside. It is not in a temple. It is not in a center. It is within this one fathom body which has perception. That means where is, uh, where is your arhanthood? Where is it located? If arhanthood is something like a phenomenon, where it can be located, where it can be existing at the moment, it is within you. So when you dispel the darkness of ignorance, pure swells out of that uh, effort. So then the world here refers to either the physical world or the sankara world. Now, here loka exactly refers to the world of beings, not that physical. The world of beings, that means humans, animals, because we are always switching from one life to the other life. Right? The human can be a cat, cat can be a human, right? <laughs> and maybe a deva, maybe a brahma. So those uh, realms, so that, that is what the Buddha refers to as loka here. Vipatti means danger. Vipatti means danger. So the dangers of this uh, world, which has, I would say, 16 realms. Huh? How many realms are there? 16, isn't it? 31 realms. How do you uh, name them? How do you name these 31 realms? We call them apayas. The starting point is apayas, hells. Four apayas, then the manusa world, and then uh, six heavens, and then 20 Brahma worlds. So this is the world that the Buddha refers to by Loka. Now, the other uh, Pali name for this sutta is Loka Dhamma. Who gave, the, who gave the names to these suttas? Was it the Buddha? No. Those monks, senior monks, who, uh, what do you call, codified, who compiled the canon. Right? Loka Dhamma means, what do you call, the reality of the, reality of these 31 planes. Now let's go to the sutta. Uh, you don't see the Pali one, right? You see only the English translation done by Bhikkhu Bodhi. We'll, we'll start from the known and then go to the unknown. Huh? That's easier, right? Otherwise, you might see what is this Pali. Huh? Because these eight worldly conditions revolve around the world, and the world revolves around these eight worldly conditions. Eight worldly conditions revolve around the world. What are they? We have to find out. So these eight conditions, worldly conditions, they go after the world. And then the world goes after those eight. So they are, what do you call? They are mutual. They are processes mutual. What are they? Uh, gain, loss, distribute, fame, blame and praise, pleasure and pain. Uh, these eight worldly conditions, once again, revolve around the world and world revolves around these eight worldly conditions. Now we will see the Pali one. Attime bhikkave loka dhamma lokam anuparivartanti. Now we will see the issues with the translation. Attime bhikkave, bhikkave means monk, loka dhamma, loka means those 60, uh, 31 uh, realms. Loka dhamma, so the loka dhamma has been eight eight vicissitudes, or I would say eight mental states, these eight mental states, lokam anuparivartanti, they go after the world. That means those eight go after the world. Anuparivartanti. What do you mean by that? Laba, alaba, yasa, ayasa, ninda, pasansa, sukha, dukta. They go after the, that means 
then if the world refers to 31 planes, then what does it mean? Those 8 go after the beings of these 31 planes. Is it true? How do we take it from animals like? Let us take a dog or a cat. Do they experience loss, gain, praise, blame, happiness, unhappiness on a daily basis? Do they? How do they get it? Can somebody tell me? How do they experience labor and uh, gain and loss? Hmm? Time to time, a pet might receive certain uh, things from the master, probably. Today, master goes to a pet store, buys a new pet food. So, then it is going to be a gain for the pet on that day, maybe for some time. And then, if the master cannot uh, afford a certain uh, desired uh, food, then for a certain time, the pet is going to lose some interest about some. So, this is going to work for everybody. In our human life, this is really uh, relevant to all of us. We will discuss that later. So, when you understand that the loka dhammas go after everybody, I mean loka means these eight things, you can see them as gain, loss, disrepute, fame, blame, praise, pleasure, pain. Let me simplify this translation. Uh, profits or I would say uh, benefits, whatever the gains and then loss. And, the, and then uh, disrepute, I would say, uh, how do you translate that? Probably uh, 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 your reputation, right? good name or bad name and then uh, praise and blame. Uh, I would say compliments and criticisms and then pleasure and pain means happiness and unhappiness. So, these eight go after the beings of 31 planes. Is it a fact? It is. And then the beings in the 31 planes also go after these eight. How does that work? Are we going to look after, are we going to go after happiness, unhappiness? Yes, we are doing that all the time. Since every morning, even you get up from the bed, now how I am going to be happy tonight, now today, which restaurant am I going to be happy, how I am going to look for uh, tasty things, how am I going to be surrounded by this and that, how am I going to uh, even erase a penny from my work, how am I going to shift my career. You are going after these eight. So, it is it's, it's clear, right? Okay. Anu parivartanti, the Pali word. Da. Anu means, what does Anu mean in Pali? I just tell you some Pali. Ya. Anu means according to. Pari means around. The Pali, these are prefixes in Pali. Prefixes, upasagda we call. Anu means according to, Pari means around. Vattanti, function, exist, work, rotate. So, according to something, uh, those particular objects work. So, Loka Dhamma, Loka uh, Anuparivat. Let me ask you then, what does Loka Dhamma mean? Those eight things. Loka means beings in the 31 planes. So, those eight go after the uh, 31 uh, planes of beings. And Lokocha Atta Loka Dhamma Anuparivat. And then, those 31, uh, sorry, beings in the 31 planes also go after, uh, go after these eight. Katami Atta. Labo, alabo, uh, sorry, labo, alabo, uh, yaso, ayaso, ninda, pasansa, sukha, dukkha. The translation. Labo, labo means gain, so maybe profits, huh? whatever you can gain. Alabo, alabo, damage, damages, failures. Uh, loss, uh, loss. It might be the liabilities also in a certain way, whatever, whatever the things you might lose, and you're going to lose at a certain point. Yaso, reputation, fame, reputation, good name. Ayaso, ill name, bad name. Uh, we are trying 24 hours, 365, not to have a bad name. Huh? 
from our family members, from our work people, from the society on the road. <laughs> also, ninda, blame. Okay, ninda, blame. Pasansa, pasansa means compliment, compliment. Sukha, sukha, yeah. Sukha means, sukha means happiness. Dukha. Unhappiness. Huh? Right. Now you can see the translation. Huh? Here, sukha has been translated as pleasure. Can you see that? You can see dukkha has been translated as pain. These are the issues. This is the this is the problem. If you don't have a Pali knowledge, this is the issue. This goes by an American translation for those people who might uh, catch up. But the Pali word says happiness and unhappiness. Unhappiness is not necessarily pain, isn't it? It is not necessarily pain. It's like dukkha, dukkha in the noble truths. Dukkha is not pain sometimes. It might be a frustration. It's not painful, just a frustration. It can lead to uh, pain. So we have to be very careful. Huh? Now you see. Ime ko bitkave atta loka dhamma loka again now it repeats just to because uh, repetitions are everywhere in the canon let me let me ask you why you see a lot of repetitions in the suttas the so same thing has been uh, repeated in most of the places if you read a lot of suttas it's, oh same thing same thing goes again and again why is it we call redundancy why is it why do you see a lot of repetitions in many suttas? Probably you might not have studied that far, but I want you to think about it. Then you, from a grammatical point of view, I say, why? This is probably a, a plague, a grammatical plague. Yes. Huh? Ah, for the purpose of easy uh, memorization. Ah, this is one, because this has been come down to us by memorization. But most importantly, the redundancy or the repetitions have been come to us in many suttas due to the reason that when we when the suttas are trying to repeat the same thing it can uh, what you call uh, it can easily get into somebody's understanding this is the idea this is the idea of the repetition for if you learn from a grammatical point of view, you will be, uh, you know, unhappy about it, right? The reason is that when it is now, f say for instance, uh, a very simple sutta. Let's take Ratana Sutta. Ete na satcha vajje na sotti te ho tu. Sorry, ete na what do you call? Yang kinche vittang idava hurangwa sakge suvayang Ratanam panita. Nano samang attagate na. Idampi buddhi ratanam panita, ete na satche na suvatti hotu, ete na satche na suvatti hotu. Why is it? It is because by, rep by repeating certain areas of the Dhamma, it is easier for uh, the Buddha or whoever uh, the other uh, enlightened ones can instill the meaning into their life. Right. This is the same thing like a reminder, right? You know this is good, but you know, can you remind me? Why is it? Reminder is always helpful. Otherwise, you might forget. Right? It's like an alarm, right? You think you can wake up. Your body clock can uh, help you to wake up, but still, you. What do you do at night? You set up the alarm. Why is it? In case we never know. This is why you see a lot of repetitions. But it's, here, it's not that bad. Same thing. Huh? Now, so far, what we have understood in this sutta, there are eight things, eight very normal things in our life, as you can see uh, gains, losses, uh, fame, I would say good name, bad name, then uh, what you call uh, blames and uh, praise, happiness. And these eight are called as loka dhamma. Okay? These are called loka dhamma. Then, loka means Loka means beings in the 31 planes. So they, Loka Dhammas go after beings in the 31 planes. 31 plane, uh, beings in the 31 planes go after these eight. 
this is what we have studied so far. Now we go to the second one. Now the Buddha says the problem here. Now this is the problem with these eight, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, things. Asutavato bhikkave putujjanas. Let's see the English translation first. It's good, da? All right. Because an uninstructed wordling meets gain and loss, disrepute and fame, blame and praise, second para, and pleasure and pain. An instructed noble disciple also meets gain and loss, disrepute and fame, blame and praise, and pleasure and pain. What is the distinction? The difference between an instructed noble disciple and an uninstructed wordling with regard to this. A lot of words are. Simply speaking, now uh, the Buddha is questioning from monks whether you see a difference between the Putujjanas and the Arya ones, Arya, Aryas, when they deal with these eight. Do you see a difference? Then the monks say, what, what monks are saying would be the next one. Bhante, our teachings are rooted in the blessed one. Guided by the blessed one, take recourse in the blessed one. It would be good if the blessed one would clear up the meaning of this. So they leaving up, they're leaving that up to the Buddha. Better you explain to us because you know everything because we are basing us on you. Now see the trans uh, the text. Now you will see the issues. Asutavato bhikkavi putujjanasa uppachati lobopi labopi alabopi yasopi ayasopi nindapi pasansapi. Sukampi, Dukampi. Ah. The Buddha says there are two people who are dealing with these things in this world. One is an unenlightened person, the other one is an enlightened person. An unenlightened person is always regarded in a name. Asutava Putujjano. Do you see the Pali words here? Asutava Putujjano. Ah. How do we understand these two? Now these refer to us. You know that somebody is here who is enlightened already. Yeah? <laughs> these two words mean us. Asutavato putujjanas. That means asutavato. Sutavato means un. Now translation goes by uninstructed. But the literal meaning is someone who has not listened to Dhamma properly. I think you all listen to Dhamma all the time. No? But the Buddha means that you need to listen to the true Dhamma. A lot of Adhamma is going everywhere. Could be. Adhamma means personalized, opinionated ideas. What you think about the Dhamma, not what the Dhamma is all about. You have to be very careful. So the Buddha says you need to listen to the true Dhamma. Why is it? Why should you listen to Dhamma? Is it a choice or is it a mandatory thing in your Dhamma journey? Let me ask you. Is listening to Dhamma a choice, an optional thing or a mandatory thing in your Dhamma journey? You, you all are on your Dhamma journey, right? Is it optional or mandatory? Ah, optional. Huh? Is it optional? Are you fine mandatory? I'll ask you. Not, not the ah. And then, how about in the back? Is listening to Dhamma, uh, maybe from a Dhamma speaker, an optional thing or, an, or a mandatory thing in our Dhamma journey? Any thoughts? Almost, I'm not, not sure about it. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. I'll pick it, pick it up. Actually, listening to Dhamma is mandatory. For what? If you want to become a Sotapanna. If you don't want to become a Sotapanna, you might not need it. But if somebody rejects in becoming Sotapanna, he is not following the true Dhamma path. Why is it in many suttas in the Sangyutta Nikaya? In the Sangyutta Nikaya, there is a certain section called Sotapati Sangyutta. If you want to search, you can search later if you want. You can do your self-study. 
In this Sotapati Sangyuta, there are many suttas about becoming a Sotapana. Buddha clearly says there are four requisites, prerequisites that everyone must follow in becoming a Sotapana. That means we all have to follow. What are they? First one, Parato Ghosha. Parato Ghosha. Huh? Parato Ghosha means? Ah, voice of Nadu. Actually, we can get deluded by listening to somebody too. Somebody can mislead us too. Right? When you are when you are very intellectual, you can be easily misled. Huh? Do you know that? Intellectual people can be easily misled because language is not realistic. This language is not realistic, but it gives you a framework to understand it. We go back to the court, the judi judiciary thing, ju jurisprudence. You see the the best fluent lawyer will pick up the case and will that win that case in the court due to the ability of speaking well and then picking up the right words, organizing well with a, with a case. But do you think that they all carry the truth, the, the real truth? Perhaps not. Perhaps yes, perhaps not. Then that means language has a certain problem. Now let me tell you why, not from my own point of view. There is a sutta in the Diga Nikaya, we call it Pottapada Sutta. What is it? Pottapada Sutta in the Diga Nikaya. In this sutta, Buddha says, Yahi tathagato voharati aparamasati. Monks, I use the language, but I do not attach to the language. Tathagato voharati aparamasati. That means language is not always reliable. It's a big concept. If somebody says language is realistic, then that is the Western uh, philosophical schools. We call it philological school, like Wittgenstein. Uh, for those scholars, they say that every phenomenon in this universe should be able to be put into language. Can we do that? Can you talk about Nibbani language? Can you put, can you put everything about Nibbana into a uh, English word? You can't. Not even Nibbana. Let's say you love somebody in your family. You love your wife, husband. Can you truly tell your love in proper English words to your wife or husband? You always run short of, feel short of vocabulary. You don't feel that you are truly expressing your love to that person. Why? Language is not that rich compared to the truth, reality. But still we have a framework. Still it is supportive. So, uh, the problem here, as I told you, is that uh, the Buddha said in the Sotapati Sangyutta, you must read whenever you can. The first thing is Parato Gosha, listening to the true Dhamma. That is a mandatory, that's the first point of reference in your Dhamma journey. Now, for those who said it could be optional, now you have some time to think about it. It's not optional. It is optional in the modern uh, way of practicing Buddhism among some people. This could be optional for them. But if you really want to uh, you know, uh, learn the true Buddhism, it is not optional. So listening to the true Dhamma is very important. Because listening can clarify a lot of things. Even if before you go for a meditation retreat, you must have listened well. Otherwise, what are, what are you going to reflect in the retreat? By closing your eyes. What are you going to reflect during a retreat? By closing your eyes and physically uh, uh, immobilize. Isn't it? So you have to learn first well and then to reflect. That learning has to learn from the true Dhamma. Whoever, I don't know, whoever the Dhamma speaker, monk or lay person, learn. The truth. Second is more important. Parato Gosha, then the second is Yoniso Manasikar. Mandatory. Wise attention. Today we will be looking at that thing too. Wise attention. We are we can be greedy, we can be angry, we can be uh, jealous, we can be generous, we can be uh, very loving to other people because of either wise attention or unwise attention. Attention is very important. Right? 
is attention automatic or you have to make an effort to make attention according to Buddhism. Now you have attention now, right? Now normally attention does not last long, right? It, it, it can stay, it can go away, especially when you uh, teach students, probably a minimum uh, one to three minutes, huh? <laughs> the attention go away. I'm asking you because I'm talking about why is attention the second mandatory requirement if you want to become a Sotapanna, which must be in your Dhamma path. So according to Buddhism, what do you think? Is attention automatic or natural or you have to make an effort to make it? Effort. I mean, I'm asking attention, not why is attention? Attention. Spontaneous, that is what happens actually. <laughs> Attention is automatic. Mindfulness is also automatic, natural, but not the right mindfulness, not the wise attention. They are all automatic. Now, even a criminal, a drug cartel, a thief, a soldier, law enforcement, they have lots of uh, sati. They are doing their plans. We never know. They are in on many. Uh, such criminals, other people, but we never know. They are doing their surveillance. They have sati, but it's not samma sati. Samma sati has to come from samma ditti, samma sankapa, samma vacha, so and so forth. All right. So, wise attention is the second mandatory thing that you must practice if you want to become a sotapa. Third one, kalyana mittata. If you want to become a Sotapanna, you must have Kalyana Mittas. Who are they? Uh, people talk about, nah, we have Kalyana Mittas. The one who gives me a ride nah, to temple, Buddhist center is a Kalyana It's not that, that loose. I mean, it, it is a big definition. Kalyana Mitta means someone who always thinks good thoughts, someone who always speaks good words, someone who always acts with good activities. It's a Kalyana Mitta. How many Kalyanamittas should we have? <laughs> How many Kalyanamittas? I mean, as a number, the, according to Buddha. There's a sutta here in Anguttara Nikaya, I think. Yeah. In that sutta, Buddha says the number, at least the minimum. We should have two Kalyanamittas, at the very least. Then the Buddha said, don't worry. You already have one, everybody. Who is that? Samma Sambuddha. Because we follow his, we have a reference to him. The next one you have to find out. It's very hard to find out somebody like that. Because a lot of friends that many people have, they always speak bad words. At least they gossip. Huh? At least they gossip about the good things. <laughs> and then uh, their thoughts, we never know what they are thinking. And the activities could be a little okay. So, Kalyana means, because why self-motivation is not enough? Somebody might say, I can read all the suttas, I can do my practice in a center, in my room. So, then why is that practice not enough? The reason is that self-inspiration, self-motivation to practice Dhamma is not adequate to really tap into becoming a Sotapan. You need further inspiration from others. Now, let's say when you sit down like this, you will listen to this Dhamma talk better. But if there is only one person, you might find a little boring sometimes, a lot of things, huh? because you get that mentality. When you meditate with 20, 30 people, you get a different vibe. Huh? You feel, I want to meditate too, why not? These people meditate. So, the Buddha says, we need that. If you don't have Kalyanamitas, you will feel your practice might be dry at a certain point. You don't want to go to that level. So, Kalyanamitata is the third mandatory requirement. Fourth one, Dhamma Anu Dhamma Patipada. Practicing Dhamma according to the Dhamma, not according to somebody's op opinions, somebody's ideologies, according to the true Dhamma. These are mandatory. Now, come back here. Asutavato, uh, that means Buddha calls the Puttajanas are not listening to Dhamma properly. So, he uses this figurative term Asutava, uh, Puttajanas, unenlightened beings. Why they are unenlightened? Because they are not listening to the true Dhamma. They are not able to understand the Dhamma. This understanding Dhamma is not the intellectualizing Dhamma. 
I think you all are intellectualized already. You can see our Four Noble Truths, Five Kanda, Abhidhamma, Nikayas, uh, Theravada, and uh, what do you call uh, a Noble Eightfold Path. It is not this understanding. Understanding, according to Buddha, is being able to scrutinize, uh, analyze, synthesize the Dhamma teachings, and then, and then bringing the Dhamma into your personal experiences. That's the hardest thing. You might learn your personal experience differently than the Dhamma. You should be able to bring Dhamma into your personal experiences. Or personal ex experiences should be going to tap into your whatever you learn. That is where your understanding becomes the perfect understanding into that proper thing. So the Buddha says, Asutava Putujan. These Putujanas are not listening to the Dhamma properly, so they won't understand. So they have all these eight issues. They are, they are struggling with uh, these eight, as you can see. But on the other hand, you can see here, Sutavato Pibikave Aryasavakas. Sutavato, the one who is already enlightened, Sotapanas and onwards, they are called Aryasav. They listen to Dhamma properly. They listen to Dhamma, true Dhamma is what they are listening to. So they, are, they have become Aryasavakas, noble ones. They are also struggling with these eight. But they are struggling, no, they, they are dealing with them in a different way. But Putajanas are dealing in a different way, same way. Now, let us go here. Tatra ko bik, tatra bikkave ko, ko viseso, uh, what is the difference between these two? How these two groups handle these eight? Ko adipaya so, uh, what speciality that we can see between these two people's handling of these eight? Then, king jnana karana, how differently? How differently are these two groups handling these two? There is a difference. Then this part, Bhagavan Mulaka no Bhante Bhante, we are basing our knowledge on you, under you. Dhamma Bhagava, Bhagavan Nettika, Bhagavan, our fall on help is you. Sadhu Vata Bhante, please Bhante, ba, what do you call? Bhagavan Tame, Bhagavan Meva, uh, Bhante uh, by yourself, Patibhatu. Etasa basta sattu. Bhante, please explain the meaning of what you said just now, this handling, two handling of this eight. Bhagavato sutva bhikkhu dars. Uh, whenever you, you teach us the proper way how these two groups handle, then we will understand the meaning. Now come to the uh, analysis of the Buddha. Yeah? Now he first picks up the unenlightened, what you call, not listening to the true Dhamma, unenlightened people, how they handle these eight. Sit. All right. Yes, Bhante, those bhikkhus replied, the blessed one said this, bhikkhus, ah, here you can see, having heard it from him, the bhikkhus will retain it. Then listen bhikkhus and attend closely, I will speak. Ah, please pay attention to this Pali sentence, ah, very interesting one. Then the Buddha tells them, Monks, sunata, listen, not even listen, sadhukang manasikarota, pay wise attention to what I am talking. Now the problem is people listen to Dhamma talk, but do they equally give the wise attention to the Dhamma talk? Not necessarily, I guess. This is the problem where many Dhamma talks, you know, go unnoticed, maybe go wasted uh, in the purpose. How do we bring wise attention to the Dhamma talk? Then you have to bring your personal experiences into what the Bhante is talking about, what he is bringing up from the Buddhist things. Otherwise, this will be just a knowledge imparting, like a think tank. Sadhukang right? manasikarota, that manasikara, that means wise attention, yoniso manasikara has to come here. Then only I will teach you. I remember what happened to Anatha Bindika's son. Na? You know Anatha Bindika, right? The, very, the, the famous uh, banker who donated the Jetavana Ram. I think many of you might have gone there, right? When you go to India, Jetavana Ram. But unfortunately, his son was not that uh, uh, devoted and then going to the temple and then listening to the Dhamma. So one day he devised a plan. The plan was that uh, I will tell him that I will uh, give some money if he, go, if he goes to the temple. He said one day to his son's name is Kala, K-Long-E-L-E, Kala. 
can you go to temple tonight and listen to a Dhamma talk? He said, okay. Uh, he did not say, okay. He said, I will give you this much money. Kaha vanu, kaha oh, yeah, 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 I will go. So, <laughs> he is very happy. So, then uh, he went to the temple that evening. So, he came back. He said, give me my money. So, father gave the money. Then he planned, the, the father, uh, what you call bank, another pindika plan, another thing. Okay. So, tomorrow, if you go to the temple in the same way uh, and then learn something, learn at least one Dhamma, probably Dhamma thing, and then tell me what whoever the Bhante told, then I will double the money that I give you. Yeah, no problem. And he's happy now, it's a money thing, huh? win win situation, right? <laughs> then he went tomorrow. Then you know what he was trying to do? That day Buddha was giving the Dhamma talk. So he thought, I'm not going to listen to this Dhamma talk. I'm, I will be sitting down. I will catch the first, the first Dhamma word this person is going to say. And then that's it. I'm going to forget about it because I need money. Then the Buddha knew his intentions. Buddha, Buddha made him not being able to catch up one, one Dhamma thing. So Buddha made him listen to the whole Dhamma talk. And finally, he became a Sotapan. Now, interestingly, how many times you listen to Dhamma talk? There was a guy who didn't like Dhamma, only want to learn one Dhamma thing, just for money, he became a Sotapan. So, can this journey become terrible? Like you see, among many practitioners who think that I want to become a Sotapan by giving to this many things, practice so hard. It's not a hard practice. It shouldn't be a rigid practice. It is a talent. How are you going to bring your personal experiences into this thing? Actually, Kala at the end became a Sotapa. And then the next day morning, when the Buddha came with 500 monks into Anatha Pindika's house for morning dana, then uh, Anatha Pindika didn't know what happened. <laughs> so he was preparing the money for him. So, then at the end of the dana, in front of the Buddha, he said, Ah, this, there's your money. Then he rejected the money. He said, the Pali stanza, which is coming in the Dhammapada, you can see. Patavya eka rajjena saggasa gamanenava sabbaloka adipachena sota pati palangana. If somebody gives me the uh, ownership of the whole universe, like a chakkavatti king, if somebody tells me I can go to the higher heaven, like paranimita vasavatti, chatumara adhikayama tavatin satusita nimma paranimita vasavatti, uh, if somebody gives me the most important thing somebody can get in this world, but now I don't like any of those because Sota Bhakti is the best, highest for me now. Right? So, so I'm, I'm trying to refer this to the Sota Pan, becoming a Sota Pan. At the same time, this wise attention. It is important. All right. So, not even listening, but also uh, paying wise attention to what you listen. Then, let us see the translation. Because when an uninstructed wordling meets with gain, he does not reflect thus. This gain that I have met is impermanent, anicca, suffering dukkha, uh, viparinamadam, subject to change. He does not understand it as it really is. So also other seven. This pain that I have met is impermanent, suffering, subject. Uh, there are a lot of problems with translation, but I will explain. Now, in short, let me tell you, I do not think that you are more into these Pali words, but I will explain to you. When a Putajjana is going to deal with gains, losses, failures, laba uh, laba, ayasa, good reputation, bad reputation, then blames, praise, happiness, unhappiness, they never think about that this state of mind, this happiness or maybe whatever the unhappiness, they are subject to changes. They think that this is a permanent state of mind. Now, when you are promoted, the day that you are promoted, uh, you might take it little differently also. You might struggle and you might think maybe next in the next couple of months, you will be uh, laid off at the same time. Today, you are complimented by somebody. Maybe some one day, you might be uh, criticized constructively. So, how do you take these things? How, do, how is your take on? 
happiness, unhappiness, whatever. Because normal people, putajjanas, they never think that this happiness, maybe this unhappiness is impermanent. Right? This is what it says. On the other hand, if you look at the Aryas, they always understand whatever the pleasure, whatever the happiness, whatever the good things, whatever the bad things that go to them, they will always change, they will uh, always uh, create differences in that experience. So, they always uh, bring that to their attention. Now, we see the text over here. Asutavato bikkave putujana suppajati labu sona iti patisang. When the unenlightened putajana receives a gain, let us say a profit, lot of profits, maybe all of a sudden he or she gets promoted, whatever the gains, at that point of that experience of his or her life, he or she never goes go to think as such. Upan no kume ayang labu. I got a gain in terms of my career, in terms of my studies, whatever. Money. So, chako anicho that uh, what you call uh, gain is subject to changes. Is gain is subject to differences, I would say difficult uh, experiences. Then viparinama dhammo. It has some changes. So, yatha. Now, I think somebody might misunderstand this thing. Does that mean that always when we are uh, what you call uh, when we are able to gain something you do do we have to bring this anicca uh, do we have to gain a very negative uh, pessimistic experience into the uh, phenomenon not exactly what this means is that whenever you get a gain you are happy definitely you are happy but at the same time you need to understand you should not be overwhelmed with this gain I am happy but I know this can go away anytime right this can go away so you have to maintain the both sides of that understand so in the same way when an unenlightened person receives gain loss everything either they are overwhelmed with that thing or they are going to they are obsessed or they are going to hate what they got so this polarity of these two is what an unenlightened individual is going going to go through that means we have to Stop doing that. If you follow this sutta, then the same, uh, the rest is the same. You can see here, upajjati ninda ayaso, upajjati pasansa, upajjati sukang, dukkang, so na iti patisin sanchikati, upannang ko me idan dukkang, tanchako anichan dukkang, viparina, same thing. Huh? We are going to uh, leave that part. We come to the other part. Tasalabo pichittam pariyadaya tittati, alabo pichittam pariyadaya tittati. Uh, what happens is that, Gain obsesses his or her mind and loss obsesses his or her mind. So, the both states of mind will definitely uh, obsess this person. When a gain is arisen, the person is overwhelmed. When the loss is arisen, the person hates that experience. So, they are into one of the polarities of these two, one of the ends of these two. If you actually on the other hand, what does this talk about? Upekha. Upekha. Metta karuna metta upekha. Upekha means you are not picking up any extremes. You have to be in the middle. When you are complimented, you simply say thank you. But at the same time, you understand this compliment will go away from me, from them one day. You are just humble enough. You maintain the middle, not falling into a kind of a very high estimation about you or very low estimation about you. Let us see uh, the translation. Fame obsesses his or her mind and this uh, what you call good name, bad name. Huh? So, he is or uh, she is attracted to gain and repelled by loss. He, she is attracted to fame and repelled by this, uh, what you call bad. That, what does that mean? Now, this further explains that whenever that person is complimented, so the person likes that experience a lot. But whenever uh, he or she is uh, criticized, the person is really hating that experience. So, we are into one of these unless we become a noble uh, person by understanding this. Then what happens? Let us go to the end here at the end of that uh, paragraph. Uh, I want you to look at these Pali words. Pariyadaya tittati. 
Haryadaya means obsesses or overwhelm. That particular state of mind, good side, bad side, overwhelms you. And then look at this Pali word over here. So, Uppannang Laba, Anurujjati Pati Virujjati. Whenever you are an unenlightened person, if you do not know how to follow this Dhamma, you will like the Laba, Anurujjati. Rujjati means obstruct. Anurujjati means you are not obstructing. Anu is a um, good version of whatever when anu prefix when when any Pali verb is prefixed by anu that means the opposite of that Pali word. Now here rujjati means obstruct, anu rujjati means compliance. Now there is a Pali name that comes from this uh, verb. What is it? Anuruddha. Have you ever, ever heard this Pali name? There are many monks. Anuruddha. Anuruddha means the one who is compliant to any the Dhamma or whatever. Anuruddha comes from Anurujjati. Then whenever you have a lab, whenever you have a, a good name, whenever you have happiness, whenever you have a uh, what you call uh, fame, uh, praise, then you like it. You are going to comply with that state of mind, highly comply with it. And when you have a loss, when you have a what you call a bad name and when you have a, a blame or when you have a what you call unhappiness, you are going to pati virujjati, you are going to hate. Here it gives as you are going to be repelled by that experience, right. So, these two areas. And then at the end it says, you can see, so evang anurodha virodha samapanno na parimuchati jati ajaraya maranena so kehi paridevehi dukkehi domana sehi paya se. Whenever you are into one of these ends of these eight, you will never get out of your next life. Uh, you are aging, marana, soka means grief, paridiva means lamentation, dukkha means uh, physical pain, domanasa means mental pain, upayasa means despair. You will never release from pain in your sansaric journey. If you really want to get rid of this sansaric pain, definitely you should not fall into uh, the two sides of these eight, you have to be in the middle, upekka. That is what it says. Now let us see how the Ariyas, noble ones uh, pick it up. You can see here, but because when an instructed noble disciple meets with gain, he reflects thus, this gain that I have met is impermanent, suff uh, is suffering, subject change, so the rest. Sutavatoko bikkave arya savaka suppajjati labu so iti padisanchikati uppanno kumi ayang labu so chako anicho dukko viparinama dammo that yatahabhutam pajanat. Let us say uh, when you are when you are planning to be an unenlightened person, if you if, if there is an enlightened person, sorry if you are if you are trying to become an enlightened person or if there is an existing enlightened person, that person is picking up every experience which is a part of these eight as anicca, dukkha and viparinama dhamma in a positive way. They enjoy it, but at the same time they know this can change, right. Not that everything will change, so I do not like anything. This is the wrong, uh, wrong Buddhism, right. Now when you meet your partners, when you are getting married, you know things can change one day. But just because things might change, do you have to stop being together? No. That is a lazy Buddhist approach, right? It is like a backseat driver, not the driver, backseat drivers telling how to drive. Yeah. So, the Buddha said that uh, experience the state of mind, but do not fall into these polarities, maintain your pikkha. That is what the uh, Aryas do. You can become a you can you can tap into the Arya version, maybe uh, even before become an Arya, by understanding every experience has the ability of change. All right, let's go to the uh, next one. Thus, here you can see. He is not he is not attracted to gain or repelled by loss. Uh, Aryas, when you follow the Arya's mentality, you are not specifically attracted or specifically repelled by them because you only understand, you enjoy that moment. Do Aryas enjoy the life? Good question, na? the noble ones, 
the enlightened folks, do they enjoy the life? Good question. Huh? So I think I can dispel certain misconception about the Aryas. Do, do Aryas, Aryas means those of them starting from Sota, Panas and onwards. Do they enjoy the life? How? Examples? Let's take Sota Panas, the bare minimum attainment. Do Sota Panas enjoy life? Yes. Married ones, Vishaka, a married lady, became a Sota Panas when she was seven and dated the man and became uh, become a spouse and had so many children, had so many grandchildren. Sota Panas. There could be somebody who already married now want to become a monk to attain sotapan. Huh? Now you see the difference. That lady, as a girl, became a sotapan when she was seven, and then uh, followed the normal life as a lay person. And there is somebody who has done everything now want to become a monk just to become a sotapan. See the difference. It's funny, right? <laughs> I mean. Well, you can make any choice, but I'm, I'm trying to tell you what you see in the stories. There are many people who became Sotapanas, they had their life. Now, let's take a Sakadagami. There were many Sakadagami lay people. Sakadagami means? Sakadagami means that you have reduced versions of lust and hatred, but not complete version. They still spend the lay life. When you become an Anagami, you might not be able to spend the lay life at that point because your kamaraga has to stop permanently. Right? Kamaraga has to be stopped permanently. You can't have a lay life at that point. Right? So that is anagami. But they still enjoy. When you become an arahant, then you will uh, stop having desires to be even to be reborn in the Brahma world and all that. So this arahant, if you if you if you read some of the texts like from the Kuddaka Nikai, Teragata Terigata, you will see how Arahants enjoy life. Actually, they enjoy better than us. Why is it? Arahants enjoy life better than us. If you read certain stanzas of Arahants, they are expressions about the beauty of the nature, you will find out how uh, insightful the way they they uh, pick up the nature. Now there was one place. Uh, it's about uh, I think Patachara. I think Patachara. You know Patachara, the the woman who lost everybody. Uh, you know she became an arahant by watching how the water came down from a certain place, high place to a low place. How many water poles we see? Have we ever become enlightened? That's also funny, yeah. The Patachara looked at one small place, it was a small fountain type of uh, waterfall and then the water came down <laughs> right. and she became enlightened. Ah, the, be, looking at that change, that means the way how she captured that thing is very, very far different from us. And then there was one place where one Arahant is uh, capturing the rain, Devocha uh, Vasati, Devocha Galagalayati, rain rains and then uh, the arahant picks up the sound, galagala sound. The rain, water flows galagala with the galagala sound. Now, we watch a lot of rains, boring for us. <laughs> but the arahants pick up even the sound of the rain. So I think, I, not I think, I fully understand they enjoy nature better than us. And there was one Pali stanza in the Dhammapada, if you can find out. Ramaniyani aranyani yattana ramati janu vita raga ramisanti nate kama gali sila. Ramaniyani aranyani, the beautiful forest. Ramani means beautiful, aranyani means forest. Yattana ramati janu, normal unenlightened people do not enjoy those places unless they go for a uh, BBQ, <laughs> like those hunters at that time. Do a camp and uh, ruin the place, come back. Huh? Vita Raga Rami Santi, the, those ones who have, uh, what do you call, eradicated their defilements, they like those places. But, Nate Kamagave, not to explore sensual happiness. The moment that we start looking for different high degree of sensual happiness, we are troubled all the time. 
we complain a lot, we go into switch from one person to the other person. If it is a food, then we're going to uh, switch to another restaurant, another food, we're going to complain about the food, we're going to complain about the experience. I mean, looking from an Arahant perspective. So, Arahants, oh, I would say even from Sotapanas onwards, they do not specifically like the experience or they do not specifically hate the experience. Okay? They are in the middle. This is what you have to practice about these experiences. I mean, whatever the gain you gain, whatever the uh, loss you will be having, whatever the good name you'll be having from your family, your work, whatever, whatever the bad name you'll be having from them, whatever the blame, praise, happiness, unhappiness you'll be getting, you have to be in the middle. Do not get overwhelmed. Do not get uh, infatuated. Do not get obsessed by that. And then uh, do not let any of these eight control you. You should control them. When they, when you let them, actually, what is the place where we are doing a lot of akusalas? When we let objects take us over, like objects. What are the objects that we uh, get obsessed? Maybe we get control. Ah, let me ask you a good question. Now, we may do uh, karma uh, in many ways. How many karmas are there? Sensualities, Rupa Kama, Sadda Kama, Gandha Kama, Rasa Kama, Pottabha Kama, Dhamma Kama. What are they? Rupa Kama, whatever you see, they are seeing Kamas, Kama as a seeing. Whatever you hear, they are hearing as Kama. Whatever you uh, smell, smelling as Kama. Whatever you taste, tasting as Kama. Whatever you touch, you like touch as a calm. Whatever you think, think thoughts as a calm. These are calmers. So normally we are get caught up with akusalas because we are not uh, strengthen us enough. We are not make us strong enough. So the objects are going to take us over. In the same way, these eight, you should not let these eight control you, take you over. All right, we are coming to the final section now. You can see now. Uh, uh, enlightened person or those who are going to become enlightened. Now today you are learning all this, so you can practice uh, on board, <laughs> right, on the spot, right, these eight, you are going not to specifically like or specifically repel, specifically hate, you are in the middle, understand him and enjoying the life too. Buddha never opposed to enjoying the life in the proper way, enjoying the life the proper way, right. Because Arahants also enjoy the life. If you don't, then you have not understood the proper Buddhism. Right? Then now we come down to three stanzas. Huh? We will see what they are. Ah, when you are not specifically getting attached, specifically getting repelled by these things, then what happens? You are stopping your sansara. You are minimizing your jati jara marana. Your sansara will be short. Right? This is what we want. Now, these three stanzas. Uh, I think the translation does not translate these three stanzas because the previous sutta also has these three stanzas. That's why. But I will translate this way. Labo alabo cha yasa yasa yaso cha ninda pasansa cha sutan cha same eight. Ete anicca manuge sudamma. These are all impermanent. Asasata viparina madamma. Asasata means sasata. Sasata means eternal. La? Eternal, but these eight are not eternal; they are impermanent. And then, viparinamadamma, subject to change. That is the meaning of first tense. Pretty clear. Then, etecha nyatva satima sumedo avekante viparinamadhamme ittasa dhamma ne matenti chittang anitto no patighatameti. By understanding, having understood this nature of not specifically attracting or not hating these eight and being in the middle, you will become mindful, satima and sumedo. Satima means mindful, you having right mind, right? Sumedo, sumedo means wisdom, another word for wisdom. Medha, sumedo means extremely wise. Avekati, uh, then when you are mindful, when you are wise, then you can see the changing nature of these eight, viparinamadami. 
Ittasadammana matenti chittanga. You are not going to get attracted by the, specifically attracted by the uh, attraction part of these eight and anittato no patighata meti. You will not hate the, red, the other side of the experience. Then finally, tasanurodha atava virodha. Now these are two words. Anurodha, sorry, anurodha virodha. Anurodha means complying with this eight, attracting with this, attracting to this eight. Or virodha means hating those eight experiences. That means the good side and bad side. Because eight has four good side, four bad side, right? What are the good side? Gain, good name, good reputation, praise, happiness. Now those are anurodha. Because whenever these four arise in your life, you are very attracted with those four, highly attracted. I think, uh, do you think that many people think that this will go away? No, they, they will never think, ah, this is permanently with me, I am permanently happy, permanently gain, uh, I am permanently praised by other people. That is the problem. And then, virodha, what are the rest of the four? Where are we going to uh, hate, loss or failure, bad name or bad reputation? then blame and then unhappiness. So, now when you understand the issue, you are never going to get specifically attracted, anurodha part, no anurodha part, no virodha part. Huh? Then vidupita attang, attangata anasanti, you are going to stop going on to these two, these eight, stop uh, going into the both unnecessary versions of these eight. Then, Padancha nyatva virajang asokang, you are going to, uh, going to be dust free, virajang, rajam means dust, dust means dust, is that dust? This is a figurative word for defilement, skilesa, dust. So, you will not have, you are going to minimize your defilements and you are going to be sorrowless, you will not uh, grieve a lot and sammapajanati bhavasapargu, uh, then you will, uh, you will then almost going to be the place where you can uh, stop this existence. Sum up, you better understand what it is. Any, any very popular place where you find out these eight, can you remember any popular place where you understood these eight, uh, anything about these eight worldly things? Can you remember? Very pop, there is a very popular place where the Buddha talks about these eight and then Buddha says what to do with those eight. Now you will be embarrassed when I mention, huh? ah, I forgot about it. Can you go to Mangala Sutta, Mahamangala Sutta? Puttasa loka dhammihi chittang yasana kampati. Asokang virajang ke mang etam mangala muttama. Puttasa loka dhammi. Not being touched by these eight things. Do not be touched by these eight things either for attraction or hate. En enjoy the experience, but do not be touched by the highly uh, what you call attracted version and the hated version. Then puttasa loka dhammi chittang yasana. When you are not touched by these eight, your, your chitta, what you call your mind is not going to, what you call sway. Then asokang virajang, same, then you are going to be sorrowless and you are going to be dust free. This is a mangal. Can you get this mangal by a blessing from a monk? Now you go to temples to get blessed. Huh? Can you get this? No, this is a practice. You must do something. I mean, they have a different type of blessing, we respect that, but the real blessings come from these things. All right, so, all right, any questions? Any questions about this sutta or something that you want to ask today? Uh, yeah, you can use the mic if, yeah. The mic works, huh? Yeah. Any questions? You have a question. Ah, ah okay. 
maybe uh, you can take the mic for the live recording. Ah, ah okay, okay, good, good. No, she has to leave. All right. All right. Yeah, yes, thank you, Mante, for the insightful teaching. Oh, I'm just emceeing, I'm not asking a question. The floor is now open for any questions for Mante. Yeah, if there's anyone with any questions. Yes. Yes. Two questions. One is like, um, like you say, intellectually you understand it. Huh? Mm. This eight. Then, how do you get to uh, to experience it? What is needed? Okay. Question. Question two. Short, yeah. short answer is why is attention. I will explain that. The okay. answer is why is attention. Uh, and then the second one is like you say second in question. the Mangala Sutta. So people always think that when you we do that we get blessing, but as you say, you need to practice yourself. Then why is a necessity to every time chant all these sutras? Hmm. Hmm. Thank yeah. you. The answer to the first question is why attention? Why people cannot uh, make uh, the way to that yeah. that state of mind is yeah. why attention? They simply listen to the Dhamma talk, and 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 primarily intellectualizing rationalizing only and they are not because Dhamma is an individual now though you listen to me or whoever as a group it is an individualistic path right uh, how do I say that go back to Swakkato Swakkato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akhalipo Ehi Pasipo Opanaiko Pachattang Veditabbu Pachattang Veditabbu Vinyuhiti wise people have to understand individually of this Dhamma so that means uh, why is it not possible for many people to tap into this uh, true level of Dhamma is because they simply listen and simply intellectualize, rationalize. They do not bring wise attention to uh, bring the Dhamma into their personal experiences and then to see the insights uh, uh, regard, regarding of that experience. One, even one experience is enough. So people should be able to bring whatever, let's say, uh, something happened in your life with regard to failure. Now, what is the most uh, interesting phenomenon many people go through when they have a failure, they are running into uh, what you call resistance. They are going to resist to that experience. They are going to say different things. Now, when the Bhante is talking about, when, when I talk about this thing, resistance is one of the ends of, polar ends of this issue. Then we have to understand, resist. we should not resist, rather we understand that failure can change. Right? So, how do I understand that? I have to go to my own experience. Right? I have to look at one of my failures in my life. How did it happen? How, how angry was I at that time when, when people rejected me? Work, maybe uh, if you are dating somebody and then how do those things didn't work and then maybe your family. So, you have to bring that Dhamma teaching to your personal, personalized, custom tailored perspective. There you are not simply intellectualizing, rationalizing. You are really bringing wise attention to see that particular event so that the, you had. So does it mean that you have to have the right condition? I mean, you happen to meet the right teacher at the same time, you happen to have that experience and also the, your personality and whatever. So everything must come. Uh, is it under definite? your control? Or, or, or I mean, can you do it? Or is of, it you have course, to have the right Of course, condition? you need the right teacher. Yeah, the right, everything has to come into uh, perspective. Well, I mean, you might meet the right teacher, you might become enlightened later. <laughs> so, uh, you cannot say simultaneously, but, uh -huh. but definitely you need, you need all these conditions. Yeah. You need all these conditions. So you have to walk the road and over a period of time. It depends. Each one is different. Now, when you go to a classroom, when you are a lecturer, you have to understand each student learns at a different pace. There are genius ones. There are uh, ones between the genius and poor level. Teacher has to go with everybody. So, in my understanding, genius one, the one who listen to lot of dhamma talk, does not does does not show what you call the proven results of becoming enlightened. 
it doesn't it doesn't matter how much dhamma talks you are it does matter how you synthesize the dhamma into your personalized experience the buddha says that the buddha says in dhammapada if you if you read the last two stanzas of the first chapter in dhammapada bahum pite sahitam basamanu natakkaro hod naropamattu gopo vagavo ganiyam paresang na bhagava samanya so buddha says there is someone who has lot of knowledge of the dhamma but there is no practice in understanding with wise attention of the person experiences so that person to him is like someone who is counting the cows of another person that person does not count his own cows he is counting because dhamma is what the buddha told so what you need is yes definitely there are conditions you have to find the right teacher then most importantly now today you understood you have to bring this knowledge the true dhamma uh, into your personal experiences with wise attention because that experience will not penetrate at the peak of your understanding if you do not bring wise attention to that experience with dhamma that's number 1 uh, okay. then the first one is wise attention thank you yeah you just now the on your mangala sutta on your bangala sutta ah yeah very good question <laughs> yes all right i didn't say Uh, the blessings that you know is not important there these are two types of blessings but unfortunately people don't understand that there are two ways to understand the blessings so there are two ways one is that you are going to because people are lazy yeah people don't make their own blessing they go to somebody and give me blessings you know i'll give you something <laughs> soldiers will take care of the i don't mind about it uh, and police person will take care of the criminals right so people so i mean this is this is kind of a notion but still go to a uh, moral virtuous monk ask him blessings is no harm because that that monk will have a lot of compassion towards you but in order for you to go to the fruition of your blessing the fruition the pinnacle yeah. of your blessings yeah. uh, you must make your own blessing i would say 40% you can get 60% is by your practice uh, if if i do the maths okay. so because now let's say you go to many places to get blessings but you never understand these eight so if you don't understand every time you have funerals the opposite of auspicious things are mangalas our mangala funerals every time when a good thing comes to you when it is uh, lost for some reasons you are suffering a lot so i would say uh, do the both i mean do the both continue to get blessings but at the same time pay more attention to how to make your blessing you have to create your blessings at the same time uh, otherwise you, you're getting only a partial yeah. uh, benefit of your blessings thank you but mm. maybe you can ask from someone uh, who has been going to many temples to get blessed but the life is still terrible and miserable <laughs> ah that's why the 60% has been still uh, dormant you know <laughs> now would i want they uh Namo you mentioned that. about understanding the dharma intellectually and also uh putting into practice so mm. is it equally important or is actually uh being able to practice it in your life it's actually better than intellectually understand it because well, mm-hmm. sometimes i find it quite difficult to understand it like theoretically everything so what's your take on this mm. well learning dhamma actually the buddha said to monks uh, alluding to the uh, venerable sariputta venerable sariputta has uh, seven or eight abilities of giving dhamma talk achikkana desana panyapana pattapana vivarana vidya uttanikam this pali word uttanikam means venerable sariputta can make deep dhamma teachings shallow that means when a monk is going to give a dhamma talk the, the monk should not make the complicated teaching more complicated because then people really so many things <laughs> right so i think it's a it's a uh, skill of every dhamma speaker to make uh, dhamma teaching to be shallow in order to understand for the normal audience now let's say everybody learn everybody listens that dhamma talk now you have a problem uh, theory wise but the theory has to be shallow but not uh, what do you call uh, underscore the meaning of that teaching you have to you have to make it shallow without Uh, destroying the pristine version now everybody knows 
basically the simple dhamma. But then what is happening? The most intellectual one will pick up pick it up intellectually, right? Maybe you will take it as intellectually. But the purpose of the dhamma, because our, our purpose to listen to dhamma is to becoming a sotapanna one day. Because we don't just play with the dhamma, right? Ah, I know this thing, you know this thing, I know many suttas, you know ten suttas. It's not our plan. That's a useless plan, futile plan. When those uh, people uh, become sotapanas in one day in few hours like that. <laughs> So we are making us funny by learning these theories only and making a game out of it. So once you learn the simple teaching, it might be a theory, at the same time it has the innate practice. The teaching has its own practice. So uh, you, you should not highly intellectualize that teaching, right? You should learn the basics of that practice and then immediately put into practice with wise attention. That is what we should do. But unfortunately, some people take it as a very theorized version or maybe uh, too much complicated. So these are two ends. So, so un try to understand uh, it has a role, it, I mean it is a two-way thing, Dhamma speaker has to make it simple too. Let's say you got the right Dhamma speaker, good condition has come to you, you learn the simple basics and you are trying to bring into your practice, practice means your own practice, your personal life with wise attention, then only you are succeeding in that, progressing in your practice. Thank you, Bhante. Yes. Thank you. So, Bhante, a good teacher, I think, is mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> because from the beginning, you are talking about mandatory or choice. So it I is. think a good teacher is mandatory, but how to get a good teacher who is yeah. teaching through Dharma? Now the problem is people understand listening to Dharma is one of the mandatory things. Now you already understand. Then who are you going to listen to? Then you have to understand that. Right? So you have to do your own search. Otherwise you will listen to thousands of talks. Nothing has worked out. I mean you know Dharma, but you feel nothing is going, you know, in your practice. Practice is not working. You have a question? Yeah. Yes. Only. Yep. Uh, Bande, uh, with regards to the practice of the reflection in the, in the sutta I mentioned, uh, about the three characteristics of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Now, uh, for... for anatta, you, anatta is not mentioned. Here. Yeah, not mentioned. Only Anicca, right. Dukkha. That's right. Anicca Two Dukkha. of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of practice of it, uh, it will depend on the individual temperament, right? To actually make mm. it more effective yeah. for the reflection. Mm. Am I right to, right to say that? Yes. Okay, yes. Thanks. Because we tem temperamentalize uh, everything, right? Mm. Now, for example, uh, when we uh, learn something, even today, mm. uh, somebody might take it differently than the other person, right? So it is very individualistic. That is why I said the provision of this progress of the Dhamma journey happens with the individualistic experience and how that individuality is going to work with that particular Dhamma thing. That is the success of your spiritual journey. Yeah. Not that you sit with many people. And secondly, why the, the third part, the anatta part, not mentioned here? If people know anatta, they would not get obsessed with any of these. <laughs> anatta, <laughs> anatta means not self, not taking us. No self. Yeah, yeah, not self. It is it is the highest. It is what we are trying to understand. So Buddha only picked up anicca dukkha here. So basically, for someone. Now for Arahans, there is no anatta. For a Puttajjana like us, we always have this atta mentality. So Buddha did not pick up from that higher end. Buddha picked up from the known end, Anicca Dukta, because we, uh, changes are very uh, normal things in our life. But unfortunately, we don't take the good changes as Anicca. Do we take like that? Do we, uh, I would say, relatively take good changes compared to the bad changes? Now, you are very unhappy when somebody passed away. Yes, we do. When you are demoted, when you are criticized, 
uh, that path you are suffering I mean you're going through a very you know pain but uh, when you are promoted it's a change and when you are uh, getting what you call different good things so we have to bring both good and bad changes possibility and then dukkha dukkha means if you don't accept the changes then you are in the suffering I remember a very funny story a true story when uh, one of my friends is a Christian Christian uh, gentleman in, in uh, Vancouver he has a Dutch friend so this person goes to Sri Lanka during the uh, winter time uh, so uh, he, he goes to Sri Lanka and then draw certain uh, you know drawings you know Europe there is a good market for drawings right so one time my this Christian friend could go to Sri Lanka at the same time he went to Sri Lanka he said I know a Buddhist monk in a temple so you can learn Dhamma so he brought him to the temple so the monk started saying in his own uh, English uh, everything is anicca, everything is dukkha, everything is anatta his whole life is a mess of suffering <laughs> then he was like he was listening to him he said okay this is how I pick it up uh, yes everything is subject to changes good or bad changes if we do not understand that everything has a change then we are into suffering isn't it the moment you understand everything is changing you accept that reality right so when you uh, do not understand the changes when you do not uh, then then you are into suffering what you call dukkha pain then you are trying to create uh, what you call this internalized self right? see people understand it very differently yeah. I, I have a few questions I'll start with one yes <laughs> yes thank you Bhante I want to refer to the Sutta study methodology you mentioned uh, early in your mm -hmm. talk you said something like uh, uh, sometimes it is important to read like a number of suttas rather than just one single sutta, if I'm mm. understanding you correctly, Bhante, because uh, some of the things in some of the key words or some of the key ideas in one sutta might be explained or differently. analyzed in other suttas. Indifferently also. Those key ideas might be differently explained in other suttas. Mm. But yeah, same, same concept. Same concept. Mm. I think one of the very good examples, Bhante, you've provided uh, is the analysis of the idea of sotapana and the conditions for entering the stream mm. and how they are analyzed and described further mm. in other suttas. So that was a really good example. So my question really relates to this, this practice or this process of uh, sutta study methodology. I mean, um, I guess twofold. Number one, sometimes we don't know what we don't know, right? Sometimes we don't know, uh, I guess, we don't know where I could find more information about this key idea or this key concept in other suttas. And so I don't even know that I don't know about it. I don't even know that I lack that information or that perspective. So that's the first first challenge. The second challenge is sometimes we might feel overwhelmed like, okay, I, I read this sutta and then I've got to find more information about these keywords and then I go to another sutta and then there are, there's more, there are more keywords and key ideas I've got to look into. Uh, what if someone thinks uh, there's so many suttas to, to, to look into? Mm. So the short answer is you need a good teacher <laughs> before you touch the books. So do not go to read suttas alone. It's dangerous. Why do I tell that? There's a sutta. I think the methodology of the sutta study is given in the Alagadhubam Sutta. Uh, if you write that, Alagadhubam Sutta. It's going to be Majjhimanikaya. You can read that when you have time. Uh, Majjhimanikaya uh, 22. Uh. In this sutta, Buddha says, learning the true Dhamma is like, is like catching a snake from its right place so that means if you catch the snake the water snake I would say cobra from the wrong place uh, even maybe from the tail maybe from the head you'll be bitten by the snake very fast but the snake catchers know how to catch the snake they're gonna use a stick and then probably press somewhere of the snake's body and slowly catch then the Buddha said there are people who wrongly read the Dhamma understand the Dhamma, they are bitten by the Dhamma itself. It happens. Psychosis. This happens in some meditation uh, programs, ending with the psychosis, 
and on this side they learn the wrong Dhamma. So how do you know that you are reading the proper suttas? How do you know whether you have the you are uh, referring to the right suttas? And how truthful and how correct is your sutta study? How do we know? As a lay person, you don't have a good Pali knowledge. Definitely, most of you. How do you make sure that? That's why we need the teacher. And plus, how many suttas are there? Dika Nikaya has 34. Long suttas. Majjhima Nikaya has 152. Anguttara Nikaya has 7,000 suttas. Majjhima Nikaya has 9,000. Who is going to read all these suttas? Do we have time? Do you have time? I don't think so. Then what about the practice? That is why you need a teacher. Teacher will tell you what are the most essential suttas to read for your practice. Problem solver. Otherwise, you are wasting time and you... I think I, I tell people, uh, do not try to self-read uh, suttas because it will kill you one day. <laughs> because you are picking up the sutta wrongly. So please uh, refer to a good teacher, follow that teacher, uh, then you will understand uh, what should be read, what should not be read. There are teachings that you don't need to read because they were given to certain individuals, not to your practice. Yeah, that's the answer. We will yeah. take one more question and then we will uh, wrap this up. Yes, that's very helpful, yeah. Bhante. Good evening, Bhante and fellow Dhamma brothers and sisters. When it comes to loss, I will assess the worldly uh, condition of loss. I believe when we lose our material possessions, uh, to a certain extent we can practice equanimity. But when it comes to a relationship, let's say we lose our loved ones and then the tendency is we are in grief. So how, how should we be mindful about practicing equanimity when it comes to the loss of a relationship of our loved ones? I uh, would appreciate Bhante to advise. Okay. Thank you. Now when someone uh, dies, who has a very close relationship to us, uh, the suffering, grief uh, can be enormous. Uh, now, now here Buddha does not talk about uh, grief as a part of these eight. He fundamentally says loss and then uh, unhappiness. So grief is something that is embedded in that uh, bigger suffering. What can we do when somebody passes away? Now you are not Aryas. Noble ones do not uh, uh, suffer. They have Dhamma Sangvega, so they understand what happened. Uh, they understand. But when you are Putujjana, you may struggle with a lot of memories with that person. So, according to the Buddhist teaching, some of the certain Dhamma concepts, uh, uh, you know, for us to understand some of the Dhamma concepts, it will take some time. Okay. Now, if you take, for instance, somebody who lost his or her, somebody next to him or her, uh, probably probably you can see that how the grief is going to certainly lower as time goes on. I think time heals. That is one thing. Because just, let's say you learn a lot of Dhamma, you know what it is, but suddenly when somebody passed away, you cannot bring that wise attention to this thing. But you can at least, at least bring wise attention. You only saw Manasikara to that thing, okay? passed away, but I did my best. There are other things attached to it too, whether uh, I did my responsibility to that person or not, whether it was a untimely death. But whatever happens, uh, if you can bring Yonisu Manasikara, although you are in grief, you will understand the basis of the grief from Buddhist point of view. Wise attention means everything has a change, right? That. Uh, change in nature of the life. So you will bring that wise attention to what happened while the time heals you and wise attention is what the moment, let's say uh, if you ask me a shortcut, if you ask me a very uh, good methodology to practice, you have to each time bring wise attention that nothing is going to be permanent. Even the Buddha passed away, everybody passed away. I also have to pass away one day, not even my rich people, right? But the grief can be enormous if, if it is attached with other things. I would say responsibilities, other relationship issues, financial issues and all that. 
So they have to be made differently. But if you ask me the general thing, I would say if you can bring every time the, when the memories come up, uh, you can bring wise attention to understand those. Uh, even there, you see the individualistic version. When the memory comes up, then you bring wise attention. This is one of the things of eight worldly things. Now I am going to experience it. This is a learning moment for me, right? Teaching moment for me. So why don't I bring this uh, sutta today, Loka Vipatti Sutta, to my experience? So I know it is it is painful, but the reality. I should not be attracted. I should not be repelled by this thing. So you try to bring it as much as you could. But the grief will uh, diminish as time goes by, not in one day. <laughs> Very interesting story. I know there was one monk went to the U.S. Uh, and then uh, there was a devotee passed away in that uh, temple, Boston actually. So the, the monk was given to talk uh, in the funeral. You know, in Western countries, they have to wear super nice uh, in, on the funeral day, right? Just to respect the person who passed away. So he came from Sri Lanka, is a senior monk, he can speak English in his way and then um, uh, now he started giving the Dhamma talk. In Sri Lanka, when somebody passed away, there is a very famous Pali stanza that monks uh, recite in Dhamma talks. This is the stanza. Actually this is one of the stanzas from the Sanyutta Nikaya, but the way how it works in different cultures could be a problem, let me tell you. Anauhato uh, tato aga ananunyato ito gato. He said this way. Without invitation, this person came here, the one who, who is now uh, dead. Without invitation, he passed away, he went. Actually, it's true. Huh? Nobody invited, nobody said, uh, go. Yata gato tata gato ka tata paridevana. The way how he came in and the way how he left. It is pretty equal. So, why do we cry? <laughs> simple class in, why do we cry? So, he said that in the audience. So, the funeral finished. One American lady who is going to the meditation of the same temple uh, on the Tuesday, the meditation said to the resident Bhante, Bhante, can I talk to you after meditation? <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, then he said, yeah, what do you want to talk? He said, uh, she said, last Saturday, you know, that we all went to the funeral, you were also there. And Bhante said that uh, uh, we don't have to cry, we don't have to worry. I think it's like cheapening the suffering that we had. We know that everything is going to change. Impermanence is what, what is uh, happening in our life, but we should not cheapen the suffering, right? It will take some time to heal, right? So, I think we have to understand that part also with your question. I think when we understand the grief, rather than thinking a very deep teaching like, this is a deep teaching, but at the same time we have to understand it will take some time to heal myself with this thing. But at the same time, during the time, we can practice this changing nature. So, there are two ways to think about this question. Some people are getting hurt when we say don't suffer. Because it's, it's you have to naturally heal, right? You can't uh, wash everything in one night, right? Yes. Uh, we had a professor like that, a Buddhist professor. And we, one day we asked, you know, coming, uh, today I'll be coming late because my wife passed away in the morning. <laughs> oh, are you going to teach us? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, they are certain different people. All right. Any more questions? May I, may I ask one more question? Yes. My question is about uh, the, the part about enjoying life. Mm. So you mentioned that uh, you gave good examples. You gave the example of uh, the Arahans. lady Visaka. Mm. Yeah. And how Sotapanas also enjoy life. Mm. Mm, I, I don't know. Sometimes there is some discussion among Buddhists, uh, I guess lay people, uh, about how, to what extent they can enjoy life. And there are some people who might feel guilt for, for enjoying sensual pleasures or they might guilt trip other people or they might guilt trip th themselves, right? They might say, oh yeah, you're a Buddhist, oh, you should be non-attached. Why are you so attached to money? Why are you still pursuing uh, material goals? Uh, why are you so ambitious in your career? Why are you trying to be an, uh, a rich and successful entrepreneur or, or whatever? Why are you pursuing 
you know, why are you going to concerts? Uh, why are you still enjoying good food? And why are you pursuing uh, maybe things like uh, romantic love, family love, and, and so on, other kinds of sensual pleasures? And sometimes we ourselves might feel that guilt, or sometimes we might look at other people and, and sort of judge them, perhaps. Yeah, so I, my question is, how do we respond, uh, I guess, to such a, I don't know, wrong view or wrong idea? Now, one thing is uh, telling other people what to do and what not to do uh, is something that is point of uh, discussion. I mean, uh, as Buddhists, we are not going to point out other person's practice. It is not uh, necessary. We, we don't have to do that. Uh, I mean, questions like how to sit down uh, on the meditation hall, uh, and all that. I mean, these are questions. Is, I, mean, I mean, I think devotees are more concerned about how other people practice this. I think we don't have to concern about it. And we have to learn from Buddha. Remember how he answered, uh, I mean, uh, one group. There was a group of uh, uh, prince, 30 people. They went for a, uh, what do you call, uh, camping. And one didn't have a partner. So uh, he brought an escort. But she was a thief. And she took away all the jewelry of all the prince, she uh, ran. And then they were searching for the person. And they saw one uh, monk, that was the Buddha. Mm. Then they asked from the Buddha, uh, the ascetic, did you see a woman who was going? Then you know what the Buddha said? The Buddha said, uh, what is more important? Is it taking care of oneself? Is it, more, is it about oneself? Is it about others? In the first place, it's about us. Then they uh, left that idea. I think the first thing is that such uh, such asking, such uh, asking is I think it's not good. It's not comfortable. I think you you will accept that when people uh, tell you what you when people try to uh, analyze about your life, you won't be happy fundamentally without you trying to think about what they are talking. I think we have to stop doing that. Number two is that. Now today you will learn that a monk is talking about that there is a certain happiness, there is a happiness that people have to enjoy, people can enjoy, people must enjoy. These people have not learned Buddhism properly. That is why they are talking as such. If they had learned Buddhism properly, that true from the from a true teacher, the true Dhamma, they would not ask like that. So now according to them, we have to be laid back, lazy. Uh, you know, uh, people who are not doing anything, uh, we don't have to earn money, we don't have to be with anybody, so we have to lock the door, uh, maybe uh, not even wear anything, <laughs> and then meditate, and then become a Nibbana. This is not what we see in the canon, in the text. So now we, we have to look at what is the basis of such things? What is the basis? How do you call that you can't be ambitious? We all have to be ambitious, right? It depends. Everyone has a choice, right? And uh, there are so many business people. Now, if Buddha did not meet Anatha Pindika, how could he get a temple? If Buddha, all the things that were donated by all the kings, all the bankers, right? not even that. Interestingly, Amba Pali, who is she? Buddha got a very big temple from, from that woman, the escort. Ambapali. Did the Buddha say, ah, you earn money by doing this wrong, unethical business? No, he didn't say. And she became an Arahan. Ambapali became an Arahan. What about you? <laughs> she was the biggest, uh, what do you call? Uh, escort in the city. And Addakasi, another, another uh, escort. She charges uh, one half of the uh, asset of the whole state. She became an Arahan. Do these people know this story? Have they read? Have they read Buddhism properly? I don't think this. So I think one thing is it's unnecessary to uh, point out these things about somebody else's life. We don't know how other people uh, do that. Even let's say you are doing a job, that person uh, analyzes it in his own way. But you are not doing as such. right? So the first thing is we should not be concerned about other people's practice unless they ask us a certain help. Number two is, I totally understand these people have not properly read suttas, at the same time the literature. They must have read these things. 
at least for their own their own personal attainment to become a better person mm-hmm. so to me there can be buddhist business people there can be all the good people in buddhist uh, background in buddhist communities yeah yeah i mean i i get the part about not judging other people i think that's not appropriate about judging others enjoyment of life uh, sometimes it, it's the maybe dealing with oneself that's tricky like like the guilt you feel like you oh i'm a buddhist i shouldn't be enjoying ah, this much but okay. i come to that point now now you are talking about guilty feeling now forget about what other people say forget about uh, their ignorance about the tax and all that now guilty feeling well you will be guilty also if you don't know the literature and the suttas <laughs> same thing applies to you or other people because when somebody blames me i say you are ambitious this is wrong Ah, I feel guilty, yeah. So, see. why? Did I have a proper reading about the text about these things, right? So, it is also because of the ignorance of the Dhamma part, mm. right? I think then better everybody should become monks. <laughs> yeah? Then uh, there will be no people to make money to give dana also, <laughs> huh? right? That's a good thing. Let's you all say we had become monk and nun. What a crazy idea is that? I mean, that is why I'm saying this is uh, a problem when people are ignorant about the true dharma. Mm. All right. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you, Bhante. <laughs> All right. So we have a few announcements. Okay. Thank you, Bhante Chandima, for your informative and insightful teaching. It was indeed a well-researched sharing on the Loka Vipati Sutta this evening. We have a few announcements later. Uh, before that, let us now express our gratitude to Bante Dr. Chandima for the Dhamma teachings today by saying sadhu three times together. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.